What was G's relation to the Christian esoteric tradition? An essay by Robin Amos. To answer this question, I want to sketch very briefly an historical picture of the origin of esoteric Christianity. If we go back to the Greece of Pericles, of Socrates, and of Plato, there was a different view of education to that which we hold today. They at least attempted to educate the whole man, whereas today we divide the process into two aspects which, even taken together, are inadequate for the whole process. In education, we largely give information, not knowledge. But what is the difference between them? In training, we develop skills and sporting ability. In modern education and training, are more and more dedicated simply to commercial abilities. Early Greek education, called the Padilla, had broader aims. It concerned itself with emotion, and it concerned itself with perception. Plato's Republic makes it clear that it also concerned itself with things we regard today as being trivial, such as the question of rhythm. These concerns continued for several centuries into the Christian era in philosophical schools such as the Stoics. Faced with the problem of how to obey the very difficult instructions given by Jesus, the church in its first centuries drew on that classical tradition for educating the whole man, but shaped it to fit the Christian experience. The results can still be observed in Greece and other countries on the eastern side of Europe, where certain Christian communities fall directly under the influence of true esoteric monasteries, including, to my knowledge, devout populations within one small seaside town and in an industrial suburb of a city. People within those communities show clear evidence of an improved level of emotional education that frees them from many of the problems common to Western populations. But even there, few of them become saints, become elders. Their tradition shows that the making of a saint is only possible with divine intervention. Paradoxically, it also shows that saints are self-made, that this same task is the work of a hero. Without the heroics, there will be no intervention. It is when we can understand and reconcile these two opposites, a cone expressed in the reality of the inner life, that we have begun to understand esoteric Christianity. Gurdjieff was a phenomenon of the East, a teacher of a kind unknown in these barbarous lands, a teacher of practical aspects of living and a shaper of emotion. Because of his novel way of explaining things, because of his flamboyant style of teaching that made it easy to avoid the searching questions raised by his very existence, and because he ignored religious language, to get today's committed Christians have ignored him. But he is an historical fact, and his influence is indirect as well as direct. The breadth of his teaching was so great that he appeared mysterious, almost magical to the Western mind, firmly shackled to its intellect. But he was not and would not have claimed to be a teacher of religion. His complaints about the religion of his time and place could be boiled down to saying that its proponents had access to, but ignored the practical teaching he represented. Today, certain Westerners cloister themselves in esoteric monasteries, but all or almost all of them find the whole thing too difficult. The emotional luggage they carry is so heavy that they fail to achieve their spiritual goals. The Sermon on the Mount faces us with the need to act in a way that is almost impossible to us. It demands that we act in a way that is possible only once we have become a different kind of being. Around 700 A.D., St. Simeon, the new theologian, an abbot and one of the great theologians of the Greek church as well, once said the same thing the opposite way around. He writes, He who does not have attention in himself cannot be poor in spirit, cannot weep and be contrite, nor be gentle and meek, nor hunger and thirst after righteousness nor be merciful, nor a peacemaker, nor suffer persecution for righteousness' sake. For saying things like this, St. Simeon was sent into exile at the request of his monks. 
This passage defines the problems of Western Christians to this day. They know the symptoms of their disease, but not the medicines of its cure. If we understand this, we will understand why. When Gurdjieff was asked how to become a Christian, he is reported to have answered, First of all, it is necessary to understand that a Christian is not a man who calls himself a Christian or whom others call a Christian. A Christian is one who lives according to Christ's precepts. Such as we are, we cannot be Christians. In order to be Christians, we must be able to do. We cannot do. With us, everything happens. Christ says, love your enemies, but uh, how can we love our enemies when we cannot even love our friends? That's from page 102 of In Search of the Miraculous. This quotation, emphasizing that people need methods of fulfilling the gospel, defines the need of the churches for G's teaching and for the inner practical teaching in general. It shows that the practical teaching is not a different version of theology, but it is essential to the implementation of that theology. To become Christian, in fact, as well as in intention, the practical teaching is necessary. But within 200 years of the death of Christ, mechanisms had developed within the human psyche that made it impossible for people to face that fact. If we realize that we cannot be attentive without remembering, then we realize from this that esoteric Christianity taught self-remembering which it called nepsis, sometimes translated as watchfulness. The Greek word nepsis is sometimes translated as sobriety, sometimes watchfulness, sometimes to understand. Nepsis, we must understand their different meanings in particular ways. Sobriety is the antonym of all intoxication, a lack of intoxication of the psyche, a state in which we remain unaffected by the distractions that would cause intoxicate our mind. The particular quality of watchfulness that concerns me is that to watch we must remain apart. One meaning of the word monos, the monos of our world. To watch while remaining unmoved, we have to remember we are ourselves apart from what we are watching. Even in the outside world, it is difficult to watch something once we are caught up in it. In the inner world, this is doubly true. I can watch thoughts only when I remember myself apart from thoughts. I can watch feelings only when I remember myself apart from feelings. I can watch my impulses only when I do not follow them. I can understand the changes in the values of my imaginings only when I remain apart, and so on. That which remains apart watches was at one time known as the noose. As a practical teacher of this tradition, Gurdjieff represented a phenomenon, a form of teaching unknown in the West. Now, Praxis researchers have investigated this kind of teaching as well as its subject matter. We have gained new information, a different understanding of the psychological method, and from five con conclusions in particular. All of these five conclusions refer to the inner part of the mind, known in the Greek of the early fathers as the noose, so that a major part of the practical teachings, in fact, comprise a noetic psychology, or psychology of the noose. Number one, about the idea of lesser and greater liberations, that the inner separation of the fourth wave requires this temporary and eventually the permanent liberation of the individual noose from the activities that normally obscure it. Number two, that the psychological methods described by G combined with others previously described by certain of the early fathers, have the capacity to liberate the noose without requiring massive initial changes in our way of life. Number three, certain changes then follow as a result of the change in the noose. Number four, that effective use of the psychological method employs the specialist knowledge on which the method is based to overcome emotional delusions and the disturbances of the noose which they cause. Number five, the process is intensified by the missing noetic method referred to by Ospinsky, which actually exists in the prayer of the heart used in the inner tradition of the Eastern Church. One fact that becomes apparent only after long study of these ideas is that the psychological ideas of the Christians known as the early fathers form a genuine science. 
This is not simply a single system or doctrine, but something much larger, a science comparable in sophistication and in its care for accuracy, with modern physics, for example. One of the characteristics of a science in this sense is that it provides a resource, a seedbed of techniques from which differing solutions can be drawn for different needs. G's instruction to make contact with the tradition was obviously intended to put his students into contact with that very seedbed from which they could then draw new solutions for new times. There are certain key concepts on which the psychological method is based. Many of these are held in common by Christianity and the great Eastern faiths. For instance, among the unwritten teachings retained in the Russian church to this day is an eightfold ladder similar to that described by Boris Moraviev in volume one of his book Gnosis and to the yoga teachings of the Patanjali. There are conscious men in Russia and Eastern Europe today. These people, known as Startsy or elders, are the researchers in this inner science, their unique work in the church and practice of Starshetso, described here by the emigre Russian theologian Nicholas Zernoff. Quote, Sarchetso was the practice of laymen appealing for spiritual counsel to certain monks known for their piety and wisdom called Startsy. The center of the movement was at Optima Pustin, a monastery near Tula in central Russia. The tradition of Starchetsko was started there by Father Leonid, a disciple of the famous monk Paisios Velichovsky, who introduced it into Russian church life at the end of the 18th century. End quote. The Steritz is different from how we imagine conscious men. Often he is invisible. On Athos, and also further east, his presence is reported by a standard legend that says that there are seven or twelve invisible holy men in the area. This worldwide legend serves as a standard in sign. It tells travelers they are in the region of an esoteric school. To be invisible means the elder has no outward status whatsoever, but is totally wrapped in humility except when he must convey authority. And when the starets, the elder, uh, asks something for you, then it is just as it was when the gospel says, quote, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And from Matthew twenty one twenty two, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, everywhere, wherever the ideas of the work have reached, even in diluted form, we see people trying to remember themselves. Time and again, they reach the same impasse. They are disappointed. They give up so much and they get so little result. The practice itself becomes the goal, as it has done so often in the churches. In this situation, we become concerned with exercises and methods. Now let us be honest. The results we seek do not increase because you cannot be in two states of consciousness at the same time. And so a general principle of spirituality is that the emergence of a higher state requires the renunciation of the lower. The emergence of attention requires that we liberate ourselves from inattention. This is what it means that methods of working on attention are indirect. This disappointment in its turn has an effect. Effort becomes weaker. Results fade still more. One forgets the real purpose of one's work, and then the second body that was being formed can even die. Otherwise, it shrinks back into an early-stage magnetic center whose aim it is to get it right the next time. With Gurdjieff's teaching of self-remembering, as with St. Simeon's instruction, the difficulty is that we cannot simply go out and decide to have attention. We will not be successful. This is part of the familiar problem where we can only remember ourselves for long periods under certain specific conditions. 
either A, when we are doing something so difficult that forgetting immediately shows in a change of behavior so gross that it is immediately visible to us even in our almost unconscious state, or B, when we have in our struggles so separated ourselves from our own habitual thoughts, feelings, and impulses to action that our underlying mind or noose falls clear. The teaching about attention is part of the practical psychology introduced into the West by Gurdjieff, part of the practical teaching of the Christian esoteric tradition. This science provides medicines for the diseases whose symptoms are described by the gospel teaching. If we forget to remember, only indirect means are possible to resolve this. The, mes the medicine of esotericism is not to give the student attention, as people imagine. Instead, esoteric science first shows its students that they cannot control their attention. This will then open the minds of some of them so that they will be willing to be taught indirect means of working on attention. The difficulty with remembering is our experience of the fact that before we can benefit fully from this traditional teaching, we must first pass an obstacle, what Gurdjieff would have called an interval. Western civilization long ago forgot the teaching that we are spiritually asleep. As a result, Western man, not knowing that he is spiritually asleep, does not even see that the obstacle is there. This is in itself the obstacle. You can find it in your own experience. One moment you wake, and yet ten seconds later you do not know that you have fallen asleep again. One moment you remember, and the next you fall asleep, and over and over. The only cure is to break the hold of external things over us. It is for this reason, and only for this reason, that Christianity is a religion of sacrifice. In the esotericism of the Eastern Church, the way to cross the interval is through sacrifice, through the method of renunciation, which lies at the root of what is called apophatic theology. But one cannot make sacrifices for nothing. As long as it is just an intellectual theology, it fails to bring results. Therefore, this method depends on giving up something lesser for an actual memory of, and more than that, a love of a higher reality. Quoting from Matthew chapter 13, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore uh, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like an, unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who... When he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. End quote. Esoteric Christianity is a doctrine of sacrifice in that it says in effect and in fine detail that to renounce the lower state requires that we give up all that belongs to it, all the related interests and all our inner possessions. Western people, including some students of the work, are unwilling to make this sacrifice. They have buffers against perceiving that it is necessary. Those buffers are reinforced by disappointment in our early work. Esoteric Christianity, therefore, created ways to resolve this situation, to redeem people who reach this point.